Iowa, is that more of a uh, rural area or an urban area? Do they have uh, large cities over there? Uh, Western Iowa is definitely uh, more rural. As a matter of fact, uh, I was, is that too loud? Okay, they're saying I'm too loud. Uh, Eastern Iowa is uh, populated. Uh, since I was staying in Iowa City, and you've got uh, more cities there. And so basically, Eastern Iowa is, is more populated, but uh, it's all important. It's all critical. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you, Richard. And, and I know that uh, they're, they're trying to get things underway there, and they're concerned about uh, how loud you're going to be. So we're going to give a, give a little bit of a break there and get back to you in a few minutes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Mike, that's on our... the Democratic side, it might be louder over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Probably yelling at each other over there. Yeah, it'll be a little more. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be very animated. I, I would like to see what's going on with the Democrat side. Yeah, I wonder if I, it I would can't be really a envision what that's there. like. Uh, let's go to our uh, to our own Darren McBreen. He is at the uh, station monitoring things. Darren, are you looking at social media? Yeah, that's right. Darren McBreen once again from our Twitter booth here at the Infowars.com studios in Austin, Texas. For the next couple of hours, I'll, I will be monitoring Twitter and Facebook, as well as keeping a close eye on basically social media's reaction to the Iowa caucus. Once again, as usual, the talk of the town is all about Donald Trump. So we're going to have to we're going to find out whether his gamble is going to pay off. We all know that last week he boycotted the debate on Fox News, and as a result, the mainstream media is is basically saying he's a, a runaway candidate, or he's a loose cannon, is what they called him. And um, also, what's what's going to be very interesting is the Democrat side. The the race towards socialism continues. And, and Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are pretty much neck and neck right now. However, we did find out from Hillary's friends at Microsoft, they have already declared her the winner. So we're going <laughs> to yes. find out what happens there. But should be interesting. Typically, the, the Iowa caucus, it, it kind of foreshadows who's going to be our next president. But not only that, it thins the herd as well because th there will be less candidates. Because what happens, those who get beaten really bad or pull the lowest they tend to drop out of the presidential race as a result of the Iowa caucus. So after tonight, the next couple of days, we're about to find out who's going to be among the real presidential front runners. Well, I think it's good we have a chance to thin out the herd. Yeah, absolutely. It's <laughs> it's we talk about, overdue. we it's do about all time. these debates, we got to go through <laughs> each candidate and, and uh, talk like, about all, all their disqualifiers. So if we can <laughs> narrow it down just a few, I think that would help a whole lot. Well, as uh, many people have said, I think it was uh, originally the Des Moines Register said there's three tickets out of Iowa. We heard Huckabee say that. I don't think he's going to be one of the three. Uh, he's way down. But, of course, the, the top three appear to be uh, Trump, Cruz, and Rubio, with uh, uh, Rand Paul moving up quite a bit this last week. It looks like the fact that Donald Trump skipped this last debate really seemed to help Rand Paul. First, it moved him up considerably in the uh, polls when he was left out of that first debate because he utilized that time very wisely to uh, take uh, questions on social media and to talk about issues in right. a thoughtful way uh, that would not be allowed in a debate, as sad as that is. The debates really right. don't cover uh, much in terms of issues. They don't allow... Uh, What's your favorite candidate? fantasy football team? Yeah, exactly. They don't allow the candidates to get out of this really tiny, narrowly defined set of issues that they talk about not only every election cycle, but every one of the debates. Tell us what your tax plan is going to be. Tell us what the levels are and the rates are and so forth and so on. And they all brag about that. If they're a governor, they brag about how many jobs they personally created in the state. It's just absolute idiocy. And they do it every single debate, every single cycle. And so it was very good for him to, to break out of that and mm -hmm. to talk to people directly about issues. Right. So he had a bump in the poll then. And then when Trump set out this last debate, it allowed uh, a, a more serious discussion of some issues because he was Trump wasn't dominating the uh, debate as he always does. And so Rand Paul was able to talk about some of the issues. So with those two turns of events, he's moved up in the polls where I'm certainly hopeful that he's going to have a stronger uh, showing in this because I would like to see somebody who is talking about genuine libertarian issues, things like controlling the surveillance state not setting up suicidal World War III triggers all around the world with right. no-fly zones. He's the only one who has any sense in the, uh, in the Republican Party in terms of the no-fly zones. And Donald Trump is a little bit uh, hesitant about that, kind of setting on the fence, but only Rand Paul says this is madness. This is Dr. Strangelove-level madness. The other guys just want to rush 
full on. They don't think that Obama has done enough in terms of the number of wars that we've gotten ourselves well, involved in. Well, they want to make sure that the military-industrial complex is well fed. That's right. right. That's right. And so that's one of the things that has hurt Rand Paul is that, you know, he's really kind of a, a guy without, a, a man without a country in a sense because mm -hmm. uh, a non-interventionist foreign policy is not something that sells well in either party. Both parties really want to have a, a uh, war, or uh, really war parties with that. But he also looks at the uh, war on drugs issue and so forth and so on. Now, when we look at what's going on with uh, Trump and Cruz, I think it's interesting that first, Cruz, in terms of, he's come out very strongly against ethanol subsidies, okay? And, of course, ethanol is making uh, alcohol that goes into your gasoline out of corn. And Iowa is one of the places where they make a lot of money out of that. So the Iowa governor... Uh, was essentially uh, unendorsed Cruz. He didn't endorse anybody, but he said anybody but Cruz <laughs> because yeah. he's going to destroy our ethanol business. And of course, the Hill reports that Trump warns Iowans Cruz will destroy your ethanol business. He says he'll destroy your ethanol business 100%. The oil people are funding him and they don't want ethanol, your ethanol business. If Ted Cruz gets in the White House, will be wiped out within six months to a year, the ethanol business. So, mm. you know, that's one area where actually I think Ted Cruz is right, <laughs> okay? But then he turns around, and because he is, uh, that, that puts him at odds with Big Agra in Iowa, he comes out and he throws uh, the this, this, this speech out about GMOs, saying, don't let anti-science zealotry shut down GMOs. So he's, wow. he's uh, out there trying to win back the support of Big Agra. Absolutely amazing what he says about GMOs. He well, says, <laughs> people who oppose GMOs want to buy organic food can do that. Well, not if you have the dark act. Right. If that you, shuts if down no your labels. knowledge of what's right. in this product. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, he is right. It is a science project. So, yeah, yeah. Right in that sense. What they have done is they've had to fight uh, state by state, community by community, to try to keep GMOs even though people really don't want them. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. There's not something people are clamoring about. Hey, could you genetically alter, uh, alter our food at, and they at least <laughs> the want to They at least want right. to know about it because we've seen the initiative yeah. shot down in places like California and the excuse is, well, it's going to cost all this millions of dollars to repackage the food. Every time you have a big bowl game or you have a new movie come out in the That's summertime, right. they repackage, repackage the, the stuff food. anyway. Right. Kind of so food. how hard is it just to put a little for. sticker on there? And yeah. it's not like it's going to make people who are just going to eat whatever they want anyway on the mcdonald's drive through windows in california it says right there on the window ingredients in our food are known to be known to be possible carcinogens and you know it's like it's right there the <laughs> yeah. label you people might still get smoke cancer cigarettes. from eating yeah. yeah that's right but but, but wouldn't it be possible for us to know i mean they don't want us to know and of course there are agricultural uh, co uh communities like in hawaii where they came in and they said, we are going to ban the growing of GMO in our community because it's going to cross-pollinate onto our crops that we're trying to grow that are not GMO. We're trying to grow a healthy premium product right. here. So they shut it down there. They have tried to shut it down with labeling at various state levels. And so what the industry has done is to go to Washington and say, we want you to pass this act that will prohibit states from making any kind of regulation about labeling of food uh, at, at that level, essentially shutting down the Ninth and Tenth Amendment so we can make this, put this stuff into the food and not tell people that it's there because we think if we tell them, they're not going to want to buy this food. Right. I and mean, that is fundamentally dishonest. And of course, they're not even going to stop at the national level. They want to go to the international level. That's a key component of these trade partnership right. uh, treaties that are about to be run through. And we can talk about how things are going to change one way or the other depending on who gets elected as we look at some of these issues. But when you look at this and you look at what uh, Ted Cruz is saying, I mean, he is simply out there for this particular special interest group and another uh, special interest group. And that's why all the big money is moving to Rubio and Cruz as Jeb Bush is biting the dust. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting to watch. And of course, you know, you're, you're speaking about uh, those international tribunals there with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So if you're a country that decides you don't want genetically modified foods, well, then now companies like Monsanto or Dow Syngenta can sue you. Yeah, yeah. And, and bankrupt seen, your country. You know, various type of fast foods co companies overseas, even if they're chains that started here or have 
offices here overseas, they don't have the same type of th things that we have in our right. food here. Mexican Coke. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, Mexican with Coke. That is sugar. a perfect example. They don't put it in plastic containers with BPA. They put it in a glass container. They don't put in high fructose corn syrup. They put in real, real cane sugar. sugar. Yes. Okay. Right. And, and so there's some other stuff Even in there that's not too good for you. But. Chocolate, you know, <laughs> yeah. as chocolate from other countries is so good, but here it's got a weird chemical taste to it. And but when we talk about GMOs, <laughs> the things that concern people about it uh, concern them in terms of destroying our food supply, as well as what other things are going to be introducing into it. It's not simply selective breeding. And I think there's a lot of confusion about people with people on that, okay? The science of genetic uh, manipulation of this is one of transgenic manipulation. It is not selective breeding. We've done that with plants and animals for a very long time. That's how we get all the different breeds of dogs and cats that are so specialized. But this is about taking something that is completely foreign. This is about taking a chemical and mixing it into the corn so that instead of having to spray the chemicals on it, you can put the chemicals in it systemically, things like that. Right. Uh, or, or creating a, a system where uh, it will withstand the poisons that they spray on it in terms of pesticides, <sighs> and, uh, but it'll kill everything else. So they use these herbicides right. and then they genetically modify uh, this particular corn, let's say, uh, so that it will not be killed by this herbicide that kills everything else. It's right, green. so the bugs that eat it, their stomachs will explode. Yeah. And then, no, there's no tie into why everyone has all of these gastrointestinal issues. They're not concerned about the health effects. They're concerned about the fact that, hey, we can sell them this corn, which is patented, will not reproduce, that they have to buy from us each year. Mm -hmm. And then we can also uh, sell them this pesticide and those two things together. So it's all about profit. It's absolutely no interest in health. And to call this, call opposition to this, anti-science zealotry. No, what you're doing, Ted, is you're preying on the innocent, on the ignorance of people mm -hmm. and you're doing it for big agra. Let's be honest about what's going on here. And, and you know, that's basically being out there for sale just like Hillary Clinton. Right, and it's also too, we think that those, those farmers who have been duped into turning their entire farms into selling genetically modified corn and other crops, yes. they're in it now. Yeah. So in order to save the country and save our farmers, now they have to save this GMO. So and we've kind of seen this, examples of this overseas. Cycle, yeah, I believe it was in India where the uh, farmers over there were using the Monsanto products and they eventually committed suicide by drinking mm. the Monsanto's products. Right. But nobody wants to take that seriously. They don't use that as an example or a template or a cautionary tale. It's like, oh, it just happened over there. Oh, it's just, it will yeah, never it's just happen. Because what happens is because of the monopoly that they set up, what they did in India and what they will do here if they get the chance to do it is to turn the farmers into sharecroppers. Mm. It's just that simple. Right. They're going to get the lion's share of the control and profits and they're going to squeeze these guys to death. And that's what all the big corporations do. I mean, whether you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the movie studios squeezing the, the uh, video stores out of business and squeezing the uh, movie chains out of business where they don't get any money except for the popcorn and the cold drinks that they Pretty sell. Pretty much, yeah. Okay, that, that's it. I mean, it is this monopolist mindset where they will not allow anyone to make any money except them. And as soon as they see there's another penny on the table, they want that. I mean, it's unmitigated greed, and they don't care about who they shut down. And, of course, right. that's what's behind all these issues that we were out in Oregon looking at. Uh, that is fundamentally the end game there, and that's what's going on with these trade partnerships. Let's talk about the trade partnerships for a while, and we talk about what happens if some of these people, uh, who, when these guys win. I mean, who is going to support the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and who's going to oppose it? Who, uh, who would, let's, let's put it this way. Who is going to oppose it as far as uh, uh, the way you look at this? I can see that Rand Paul appears to yeah. be opposing it. He opposed right. at least the process that said this is not a treaty, Let's yes. fast track it. And he said, no, wait a minute, this has been done in secret. There's no reason we right. should shut down the ability to uh, offer amendments to it after we see it. And that sort of, it was a very raw deal in terms of that process. He voted against that. Right. Well, and similar Hillary, to what we've seen Pelosi say, you have to pass it so you can find right. out what's yeah. in it. Yeah. yeah. And that turned out so great. And of course, Hillary, for years and many votes, she was very much for the Trans-Pacific Partnership until just... I don't know, maybe six, seven months ago, she finally said, oh, well, I've changed my mind. Mm -hmm, After mm -hmm. it was already all the She said she's changed was, her mind, but we know. authorized. Yeah, we know that she's going to change that. As a matter of fact, we got a clip of Hillary talking about how she cannot be bought, and we should play that here. But I think that is something where she's going to flip that position. Uh, Bernie Sanders, I believe, says he's against uh, the TPP. Uh, again, as I said, uh, Rand Paul, I'm not really sure how he's going to vote on the TPP, but he voted both times it was up against the TPA. The other senators who are running Rubio voted both times for it. 
And that is essentially a vote to subvert the constitutional process by saying, this isn't a treaty. We don't need to have two-thirds of the senators vote for it. We're just going to have a simple up-and-down vote. And uh, then we had Ted Cruz, who has been uh, uh, for it before he was against it, as they mm -hmm. would say. Okay, right. so he's been on both sides of this issue. He did not oppose it on principle, constitutional principles, saying, wait a minute, there's a process in the Constitution by which we ratify treaties. Uh, he didn't oppose it because it was secret. It had something to do with the Exxon Bank. And he, he came in at the last minute and changed his vote because his vote